Yeah, okay then. So it's my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Hedi Atush, uh, uh, who just told me that he just obtained the Donzi Prize. So uh, congratulations for, for this uh, award. Uh, today he'll be talking about uh, acceleration of first order optimization algorithms via Dant uh, inertial dynamics. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I can start. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. Uh, uh, <coughs> Boumedi and Namzi for this kind uh, introduction. And uh, it's great pleasure to talk about this topic, which is uh, one of my favorite topic. That is to say the use of uh, inertial dynamics, inertial continuous dynamics, in order to design fast methods for optimization. Right. Um, so I'm going to start uh, with a general introduction about uh, gradient method in order to fix the notation and uh, uh, the main uh, objective of this lecture. So uh, roughly speaking, we work in a general real bar space. Since we are interested both with uh, finite and infinite dimensional problems, and we want to minimize a function f from h into r, which is uh, differentiable. We assume that we have access to the gradient of f uh, at any point x of h. Uh, unless uh, specifically, uh, specifically specify, we don't assume f to be convex. So we're interested in critical point or local minima. When f is convex, we should specify it. So the simplest uh, dynamical system, which is useful for optimization, is the gradient flow, or so called the continuous steepest descent, which is here at time t x of t x of t is the the, the state of a system at time t, x of t belongs to h, x dot of t is the classical notation for the time derivative, so a mechanical notation is g over dt of uh, the function t <coughs> gives x of t. So it's a first order uh, differential equation, first order in time and first order in space. Right, and Cauchy in uh, 1847, Already uh, at the intuition of the useful of this uh, system, introduce this discretized version of the system with S is the step size. And he had the intuition that this uh, <coughs> algorithm is useful for optimization. Here is the picture. Uh, in black, you have a level, uh, a level curves or level surface of a function F. In blue, you have a continuous trajectory, which are they are orthogonal to the level surface. And in red, you have the corresponding algorithm. You see, you pass from xk to xk plus one by uh, following the opposite of the gradient f at xk. Right, after this uh, very uh, classical uh, um, recall, in fact, you see, this was in 1847. And surprisingly, took more than one century in order to have the first mathematical development, rigorous development for the study of the asymptotic behavior of the trajectories. And the first progress came from real algebraic geometry when f is a real analytic function here in the case of a finite dimensional space, for example, think to a polynomial of, of uh, many several variables. So Loyazevich is a Polish mathematician. He was working in IHS, which is a famous institute located at Bure, close to Paris. And in 1965, he proved that any bounded trajectory of the system, when f is real analytic, converts to a critical point of f. And uh, the tool which was used for that is the so-called Loyazevich inequality, which is here, it relates the, the value of f to the value of a gradient close to a critical point. The other <coughs> important progress concerning uh, the understanding of this system was in the 80s, in the case where f is convex, maybe non-smooth, in that case you are to replace the gradient by a sub-differential. And it's uh, the time where there was a, a big blowing of the nonlinear analysis. And in order to uh, generalize the classical uh, uh, Hill Phillips uh, theorem for generation of uh, 
semi-groups of contraction. In the non-error case, the basic notion was the notion of maximal monotone operator. And the gradient of a convex function is an important case of this uh, class of operator. And in that case, uh, they prove Brazil's Brook, Bayon, they prove the convergence of a trajectory to uh, minimize weak convergence. And uh, the basic tool in that case is the use of the Opial lemma. Opial is still a, a Polish mathematician. And you have this rate of convergence. Right, you see that in both cases, we, we do a, a geometric assumption on F. Indeed, without geometric assumption on F, you may have not convergence of the trajectories. Okay, this is a famous counterexample by Palis de Melo, known as the Mexican hat, which uh, shows you, here is the picture, the function is from R2 into R, it's infinity, it's described in, with polar coordinates. This makes the computation easier, easy. Here is the graph of F, and you may imagine that you have a drop of water which slides down this graph and which turns, you see, because of this small narrow valley, it turns infinitely around the base of this function. Indeed, if you consider a trajectory of the steepest descent, you have this relation between the angular theta and the radius r. You see, when r goes to one, when it goes to the basis of the, of the function, this theta goes to infinity, you, so you turn infinity. So you have to make a, a geometrical assumption in order to obtain convergence. And in the case of gradient system, you have exactly the same picture. The point here is that with a discretized version, in order to get close to the continuous and to preserve a con nice convergence property of a continuous uh, dynamic, you have to take S small enough. In order S is to be less than two over L, where L is the Lipschitz continuous, the Lipschitz constant of gradient. And you have exactly the same kind of result in the reality case. And recently you have extension to a semi-algebraic case care theory and in the case convex, right. And uh, so at this, at this point, you see, uh, you have nice convergence uh, theory, but uh, we, we, without <coughs> further geometrical assumption of on F, like strong convexity or uh, KL properties in algebra, you, you have only this rate of convergence one over K, which is rather disappointing and not too good for a numerical point of view. So there has been a, a drastic, uh, very important progress, which has been made in the 1980s by the Russian school. It's Nesterov who introduced an accelerated version, an accelerated gradient method. You see here is the, a modern version of uh, Nesterov. The historical Nesterov is a little more complicated, you see. The important point is that you have here this coefficient one minus three over k. Uh, here is the picture, you see? In the classical gradient method, you are xk and you compute a gradient step. Here, you take it's an inertial method. You take advantage of the, of the past, the very close past, xk minus one, and you are confident in, two, in this direction. So you go a little further in this direction, that's the extrapolation step. And what's important is the coefficient of the extrapolation. It's one minus alpha over k, where alpha is greater or greater than three. So it's a very uh, subtle tuning of the extrapolation parameter. Here it goes to one, but it goes to one in a very controlled way. It's not allowed to be equal to one. It's not allowed to go too fast to one. It has to go to one in this particular way. And so doing, if you do this extrapolation step, then you perform a gradient step. That's an Esterov algorithm. And what's important is that this result is in some sense optimal, an optimal result. I don't want to enter into the details, but roughly speaking, uh, with the work of Nemeroski Yudin in 1983, they showed that you cannot expect uh, uh, a better result. In fact, we shall see that we can pass from capital O to small o 
but uh, okay, that's not so important. We recall just you, you have to remain that one of the k square is in some sense optimal. Right, and the point is that uh, when you asked uh, Nesterov about uh, this algorithm and the understanding, so Nesterov was not able to explain his algorithm. Nobody really understood the meaning and uh, of this algorithm. It intensively used in the signal image uh, community because it's very simple and it provides um, a fast, uh, let's say, convergence rate, but nobody really understood uh, the meaning of this algorithm. So <clears throat> the point is that if you want to understand them, then you have to go through dynamical system. Dynamical system is the key in order to, to understand the acceleration of gradient method. And that's what I'm going to explain in the part two of the lecture, or this introduction. I'm going to, in some sense, to explain Nesterov algorithm, the modern view of Nesterov algorithm. And since you understand from a dynamical point of view this Nesterov <coughs> algorithm, then you are able to improve it. You see, it's, in mathematics, it's fundamental to understand. If you understand things, then you can improve, you can uh introduce additional aspect and so on so we are going to to improve drastically Nesterov algorithm with uh, geometrical damping Tikhonov regularization dry friction damping passing to a constraint problem non-convex optimization and so on then we, <clears throat> but i'm not able to explain all of these topics each of these topics deserve uh, a full lecture so I, I think I, I, I will detail point two and three and just give a very brief idea of the other point. So let's come to the second part of our lecture, the understanding of Nesterov algorithm from the dynamical point of view. The history, you see, we are really with the uh, <coughs> Russian school. Uh, it's Polyak was really the first who had the intuition of the importance of uh, Mechanical, mechanical dynamical system to explain optimization and introduce what is called the heavy ball friction method, HBF, which is here. So now it's a second order. You have the acceleration which comes into play. Here is the velocity and the gradient, and gamma is a viscous damping coefficient. Viscous is the friction which is associated with a fluid like the air, the water, the oil, and so on. And if you have, want to have a mechanical intuition of the heavy ball with friction method, so look to this picture in the product space, here is H, here is R, here is the graph of F, and think to a point, a material point with mass M. Here the mass has been normalized equal to one, okay? And the mass, <coughs> the heavy ball, moves on this surface under the action of three forces, the gravity forces, which has been normalized equal to one. A reaction force, the, the material point is subjected to, to stay on the graph. So you have a reaction force, which is normal to the graph, orthogonal to the graph, and a friction force, which is opposite to the velocity vector. And if you write the equation of mechanics, you obtain a system which is a little more complicated than this, but when you are not too far from equilibria, you can linearize and obtain this system. So this system gives you, uh, this, mechanical in, this mechanical interpretation gives you uh, a good understanding of this, uh, of this system. And this system you see because of inertia, you are able to explore local minima. If you have enough energy, enough velocity, enough potential energy at the beginning, then you are able, for example, to, to, to go beyond this point, to explore this one, so it's a very good model for exploration of local minima. But from, uh, let's say, a numerical point of view, it's rather disappointing because the rate of convergence is roughly the same as for the continuous steepest descent for gradient method. So uh, that's like, you have still a convergence of a trajectory to critical point. This is a result by Arouge and Duby. Journal differential equation. And in the context case, it's an important paper by Alvarez and Saikon 2000. So obtain this rate of convergence and convergence of trajectory. 
But as I say, you have still this rate of convergence, so it's not as good as we wish for a general convex function. But for stronger convex function, you have a nice property. If you choose the damping coefficient accordingly to the geometry of f, here is the same mu, mu in here square root of n, then you have exponential convergence rate. So you see the, the link, which is a general feature between the geometry of f, the damping coefficient, and the convergence rate. See? Right. If you want to have a, a general picture about the dissipative autonomous system, here is the system is autonomous. Uh, we had recently uh, a survey paper which published in Journal of Ur European Math Society, which gives you a, a rather general idea of this topic. So if we want to go further, we have to uh, to play with uh, with the damping. You see, the, the optimization property of the system comes from the damping. If you have no damping here, you have a conservative system with a periodic, quasi-periodic uh, trajectory. So if you want to, to optimize, you, you have to, to work to design this damping term in a better way. If you take a fixed viscous damping, just like uh, uh, in the heavy-ball restriction method, what happens in the worst case, for example, when F is uh, very flat around this minimal, is badly conditioned, what happened is that the acceleration is negligible with respect to the velocity, which means that, okay, the system just behaves like the steepest descent, okay? So that, that's not good. Uh, what, what you have to do in order to enforce uh, the inertial aspect is to have a coefficient, a viscous coefficient, which goes to zero as t goes to infinity. If gamma of t is bounded from below by a fixed point, constant, it's just like in the preceding case. So the decisive idea is to allow to pass from the autonomous system to a non-autonomous system by allowing the damping coefficient to go to zero as t goes to infinity. So, but this means uh, analysis, which is not trial, you see not immediate, since now we have to, to work with the asymptotic behavior of uh, inertial system, non-autonomous, non-linear uh, inertial system. So that's not so easy. And uh, here are two uh, important steps in, in the understanding of the system. The first by Cabo, Engler, and Gadat, what's published in Transaction of the American Math Society, 2009. They showed that the, the critical property to obtain optim an optimization property is that gamma is allowed to go to zero, but not too fast, which means that this integral is to be equal to plus infinity. See, uh, if, if gamma goes to zero too fast, uh, this is finite and it's, it's not good. Okay, so this, uh, for example, you may take gamma constant, you are in the case of the ball, so you know that you are minimizing, but it can go to zero, but uh, you have to, this integral to be in plus infinity. And the understanding of the, sorry, the understanding of uh, convergence rate been obtained by a paper with Cabot, Journal of Differential Equation, 2017. It's based on, uh, let's say, integral calculus. You introduce these functions, exponential of integral of gamma, and gamma is P of T integral, et cetera. And the condition which allows you to, to analyze the asymptotic behavior is that the sup of these two function is strictly less than three over two. So if you assume that, then you have this rate of convergence. Now, <clears throat> let's return to, um, to a situation. Uh, the smallest gamma, see, if you want to enforce, if you want to enforce the inertial aspect, the damping coefficient is not to be too large. It's too large, so the damp the acceleration is is uh, is killed in some sense. So the smallest gamma you, you are allowed to take is gamma of t of order one over t. You see, if you want this integral to be plus infinity, you are not allowed to take one over t square. You can take one over square root of t, but the critical case is one over t. So if you take gamma of t equal alpha over t. 
then this integral, uh, it's immediate to compute them. It's very easy, you see. Here you have a log, exponential of a log, and so on. So you, you immediately obtain that capital gamma is T of alpha minus one. So if you take the product of the two, you see T cancel, you obtain alpha over alpha minus one. So alpha over alpha minus one is equal to three over two, specifically, precisely for alpha equal three. So you make appear alpha equal three as a critical value for the understanding of the behavior of the system. And that's test error. You see, uh, this damping uh, is in some sense the best damping you can imagine for, for this system. For alpha equal three, you obtain the Nesterov method, and this was discovered by Suboid and Candace in NIPS uh, 2014, and they obtained the Nesterov of this continuous dynamical system. But that's, a, that's the first time, you see, people was able to make the connection between the Nesterov algorithm and the continuous dynamical system. We shall see in a moment, but when you discretize this system, you end up with Nesterov, and you obtain one over T squared. And what we discovered is that the coefficient alpha is very interesting. Nesterov historically corresponds to the case, critical case alpha equal three. If you take alpha strictly greater than three, it's a paper we, prob we publish in math programming with Bani, Pepuki, and Rodon, you obtain better, better rate of convergence. You pass from capital O to small o, and most important, that's fundamental, you obtain the convergence of the trajectories. The trajectory do convert. You have a certificate of convergence of a trajectory for a Nesterov method. If you just, instead of taking three, you take 3.1, it is numerically, you see, it's equivalent, you have convergence. And it's an open, it's most, one of the most challenging open problem in this theory is that for alpha equal three, we don't know if a trajectory do converge. It's an open question. But if you take just alpha, strictly greater than three, 3.1 or 3.0.1, you have guarantee of convergence. And for curiosity, we, we investigated the case where alpha is less than three, and you have this picture, you have a continuous change. You see, here is the dynamical system, here is the convergence rate, here is the, the, the exponent which enter the convergence rate, and when alpha goes from zero to infinity, then from zero to three, you you go progressively from zero to two, and then it's constant, the rate of convergence. And you can show that these rates of convergence are optimal. You cannot obtain better. And this, uh, for example, you can uh, you take a function uh, very simple in one dimension, then you can uh, exhibit explicit solution of the system and show that when the function becomes very flat, that is when gamma two goes to infinity, then the rate of convergence here, when gamma goes to infinity, this goes to two. So you obtain one over T square as a, <coughs> a convergence rate. So this is optimal. And the optimality for alpha equal three is in the opposite case is obtained for sharp functions. If you discretize this system, that's what I, I said before, the work of uh, Suboid Candace, you discretize this system, the sensitive point is discretization of the acceleration of the velocity. Here you have some flexibility, it's not so important. The critical point is the sensitive point is the point at which you discretize the gradient. If you take yk equal xk, you, have, you obtain the heavy ball. It's not so good except in the strongly convex case. If you take the implicit discretization, then you are very confident about the fact that you have similar result as in the continuous case, it's a general property, implicit discretization do, do preserve the convergence property of the continuous system. Then you have the inertial proximal algorithm of Guller, Beck, to Bull, which is here. And <clears throat> if you replace the prox by a gradient step, see, this, this is a very good algorithm, but you have a prox which is implicit, not uh, always easy to compute. You replace the prox by a gradient step and you obtain this. Here are the picture. Uh, the picture I, I gave you at the beginning is the Nesterov inertial gradient algorithm. You see the optimality here. You see the direction here is orthogonal to the surface. If you do the opposite, if you take the 
the orthogonality at the end point, that's the prox, you see, that's the prox algorithm, and okay. And if you combine the two, uh, if you want to minimize f plus g, where f is convex, smooth, and g is non-smooth, you take the prox with respect to g, sorry, and the gradient with respect to f, this unifies the gradient and the prox. You see, if you take f equal to zero, you have a prox. If you take g equal to zero, you have a gradient. So this contains the two cases. You have exactly the same uh, convergence rate. And these are recent results, you see, from Chambol de Salle and uh, the Boulin and so on. Uh, here's the picture exactly for the proximal gradient algorithm. You have a picture with the convergence rate of a method. So it's a very simple method, which has been very successful. One of the most uh, used uh, application of this method is the FISTA method, fast iterative self thresholding algorithm. Well, G is just the uh, L1 norm. And in that case, the proxy just uh, uh, the soft threshold algorithm, you see, which uh, makes uh, the current state equal to zero if you are in this interval or otherwise just the identity. And uh, this uh, algorithm has been very successfully applied to uh, signal image processing in order to force uh, sparsity. Right. And uh, S has been to less than that. Right. There is another interesting algorithm which is naturally rela related to. Uh, the discretization of the dynamical system. When f is convex, logarithmic is and proper, the idea is to replace f by its Moro envelope, which is here, which is still convex. C1, here's the gradient, and it's one of the lambda which is continuous. So you, and you, the, the mean is preserved in the solution. So the idea is just to apply the Nesterov uh, gradient method to uh, f lambda instead of f. And in that case, you see, because of this formula, you obtain uh, the relaxed prox inertial proximal algorithm. Okay. Here is yk, the prox, and xk plus one is a convex combination of the two. This is a, a relaxation. And uh, this is something very interesting, especially in the case of uh, general maximal monotone operator, because the relaxation helps to correct some drawback of the inertial. For general maximal monotone operator, the inertial is sometimes not so good. You see, you're not allowed to, to make a, such a brutal uh, uh, extrapolation. So you, there is a balance between extrapolation and relaxation. And this is a useful uh, tool for dealing with general maximal monotone operator. So <clears throat> now, so that, that's a modern view of uh, of Nesterov method. And uh, since you have uh, understand that, you, you are able to improve it. And I'm going to insist of uh, one improving, which is uh, rather recent. It's a joint work with uh, Bani, Fadili, and Riyai. Fadili is from the uh, EUF in, uh, <coughs> in the University of Caen. Shbani and Fadili and Riyai are former PhD student of I, they are now uh, a uh, professor in uh, Morocco, in uh, Marrakech. It's a paper which has been uh, published in that program. Right. And uh, so now we, we suppose that F is convex. Okay. Uh, by extension to case non convex, but we suppose that F is convex. H is a really broad space, a product, and the norm. Right. And here is the dynamical system. Okay, if we draw this term, you recognize the preceding system. And the new thing is the introduction of uh, another damping term. As I said before, you see, when you work with uh, damped inertial dynamics, optimization comes from the, the design of a damping term. And in the Nesterov approach, you see, the damping term is not so clever. Why? Because when you take only this term, you see it's uh, <clears throat> isotropic. This damping completely ignores the geometry of F, you see? And when F is badly conditioned, this is not a too, too good uh, 
damping. This creates a lot of uh, uh, wild transversal oscillation. So the idea is to introduce an additional geometric damping, which takes care of the geometry of F. And the natural matrix, which comes into play, is the Asian of F at X of T. Since F is convex, this is a, a <coughs> semi-definite positive matrix. So here we have in damping term, we have two terms, one which is the accelerated gradient of related to the accelerated gradient of Nesterov, and the other term which is designed to neutralize the oscillation. Because what people say about uh, Nesterov uh, method and FISTA, they say that the main drawback is that uh, when the problem is not <coughs> good conditioned, then you have a lot of oscillations. And then the oscillations are not good for, for optimization purpose. So you, you don't want to follow this oscillation. And B, B of T is a scaling factor, temporal scaling factor. Right. And uh, so you may say, OK, nice. Uh, the Asian is a nice operator. But I don't want to work with the Asian. So from a numerical point of view, it's awful. You don't want to deal with this with the Asian, you see. Otherwise, you are in the <coughs> realm of uh, Newton methods or quasi-Newton methods. So, so that's not too good for uh, machine learning and, uh, and, and so on. But the point here is that you have not to compute the action of f. You have to compute the action of the action on the velocity vector. And this action is just a derivative. It's the derivative of a gradient of f of x of t. If you derivate this with a classical uh, derivation chain rule, then you obtain this formula. So when you discretize this system, you see, since this is the derivative of this, discretization gives just the difference of a gradient at two consecutive steps. And this is quite free from a numerical point of view. You see? Here you keep memory of a preceding step, and here you keep memory of a gradient of a preceding step. So you have just a, a little bit me more memory to, <coughs> to deal with, right? And the convergence rate is preserved, and you have an additional uh, <coughs> estimates, which gives you that a fast convergence of a gradient to zero. Right, and so there is a rich history uh, <coughs> behind this system. Already in the paper of uh, Alvarez, he was uh, aware of the fact that uh, uh, it's a good idea to replace uh, the constant time, the identity of uh, Polyak, of the evil, by a matrix, which is anisotropic and takes care of the function, the geometry of F. And he was able to do that when f was a quadratic function. When f is a quadratic function, then you can take a matrix which is fixed. But for general function, you see, the general idea is that the matrix, uh, <coughs> which is good from a general point of view, is the Asian of f. So there was progress uh, concerning this system, 2002, 2012. It's only recently, after the discovery of Suboid and Candace, then we combine this idea with, uh, with the fact that we take uh, an asymptotic vanishing damping here. And here, I refer to the recent paper with uh, Spanif and Demuriai. And there are several, because of the importance, this is something very important that uh, we shall see in a moment. Uh, there are several related works uh, uh, which work on this kind of idea with different approach. Uh, Shidu, Jordan, and Sue, they did a nice work. Lynn Jordan, Castera, Boltfevo, they Powell's from Toulouse, they had a nice application to, to deep learning and, and many others. Right. And from an ERCL point of view, you see the drastic effect of the introduction of the Asian. Here, we, I take voluntarily a function which is very badly conditioned, you see. Here, uh, <clears throat> the eigenvalues are always between 1 and 1,000, OK? So in blue, you have a trajectory of, uh, <clears throat> of uh, Nesterov of the uh, C. 
uh, where you have just the viscous damping which acts. So you have really wild oscillation in blue. It's awful, you see. And here is here are the values. Here are the trajectories. And if you introduce the Asian damping, then you see you have a red curve, and now you completely damp uh, the oscillation. So uh, this term has a really uh, drastic effect, especially when uh, uh, the problem is not good condition. In fact, there is a, a very interesting connection since you are interested with dynamical system. There is, uh, there is a, an interesting approach, uh, sorry, to this uh, system, which is connection with the Newton method. Start with a function which is convex, C2, you want to solve uh, this equation by the Newton method. So here is the Newton method, here's the derivative of gradient, you see, the nation. And the continuous version of this system is here. And this is ill-posed, because in general, this is not invertible, or even if it's invertible, you don't know how to invert it. Okay, so the only thing you have the first integral, you see this term is derivative of this one, so you can integrate. But since you do that, then you, you, you stop. You are not able to, to, to write one line more mathematics. So the idea is to regularize this system. And that's the levenberg marker regularization. This matrix is uh, semi-definite positive. So you, you add some constant IV identities. So now you have a matrix which is invertible. So this is a well-posed dynamical system. And we studied it with Ben Arsweiter in Cycon, Cycon 2011. And we want we showed that this dynamical system is well posed, and in then, in, in fact, we had a very uh, weak assumption. The gamma of t uh, may, may be very small. The critical case is exponential minus t. So with a very small gamma of t, you have a system which is well posed. And in fact, we, <coughs> our system, which is here, is just an inertial version of the system. So you can see this system from different perspectives. You can see it also as an hyperbolic regularization of the uh, levenberg marker dynamical system. Right, so let's come to a little bit of uh, mathematics. Uh, what are the mathematics be <coughs> behind the study of the system? And uh, with the modern view now, the mathematics is uh, quite simple, you see. Here is the theorem, <coughs> alpha greater than three, as I said, is critical. The convergence rate, if beta is strictly positive, you have, so <coughs> if this term, uh, if beta is strictly positive, you have this additional estimate, sorry, on the gradient. If alpha is strictly greater than three, you have convergence of trajectory, small o, and uh, this <coughs> additional estimate. And the mathematical analysis is the Apunov analysis. You see, if, uh, that's the only proof we have of the, uh, Asymptotic behavior of the system. And here is the Lyapunov function. And it took many years before discovering this Lyapunov function, which in some sense is quite natural. You see, it's a weighted sum of basic blocks. You have a value of function, m is the, the infimum of f, value of function. Here, when you develop, it's uh, the square of the velocity, it's the kinetic energy. And you have the, the, what's called the norm of uh, x of t minus x star, where x star is in equilibrium. That's uh, what we call the anchor function, the distance from the trajectory to uh, an optimal solution. And here you, 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 you have to, to mix this, uh, this term with ad hoc coefficient. And uh, if you derivate that, very simple, very simple. Uh, you see, the difficulty was to find the good Lyapunov function. If you derivate it, then you have just a three or four lines computation. You use the conductivity of f and the, the equation which is here. When you derivate, you see you make up here the second derivative. You replace by its expression in the equation. You use convexity and you obtain image like this inequality. And from that, you see the conclusion is very easy. If alpha is greater than three, this term is non-negative for t large. This is non-negative, so e dot is less or equal to zero, so it's decreasing, so it's bounded from zero, it's bounded from above, it's bounded from above, this is non-negative, so this is bounded from above, this means that t squared times f of x minus the infimum is bounded, so this gives you the rate of convergence. And when beta is strictly positive, by integrating, you obtain the estimate in the gradient. 
So the, the analysis is, uh, is very simple. And in the, <clears throat> when passing to the, to the, algorithm, okay, here is a dynamic here. We have just for the technical point, you can take one here, but it simplifies to, to, to make, uh, to, to introduce this scaling, which is negligible if you want. And uh, you make this discretization. So you obtain the, the algorithm we said at the beginning. You have a related algorithm introduced by Shi Yu, Jordan, and Su. And uh, your Lapuna function is quite similar. And you, here is the convergence theorem. And the only difference between the continuous and the, and the algorithmic development is the following point. And in fact, it took us several years before passing from the continuous Lyapunov analysis to the discrete Lyapunov analysis. That's the reason why it took uh, two or three years. Uh, we, we obtained the Lyapunov analysis very, very early in, in 2016. And it's only 2020, then uh, we obtained the corresponding uh, algorithmic version because you have to use a reinforced version of a gradient descent lemma, which is specific to the case where f is convex. If here is the classical gradient descent lemma, when f is convex, you have this additional term, which is essential in order to, to make the proof work. Otherwise, there is no technical difficulty. And here is a numerical experiment. So please tell me how, how much time do I have to yeah, yeah, there's no real time limit. Actually, you can you can continue and yeah. But there's about, no limit. Don't limit. <laughs> yeah, there, yeah, there's no yeah, there's no limit. Yeah, really. Yeah. I'm familiar with constraint optimization. You see, uh, <laughs> I think more easy with constraints. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here, there's no constraints. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, let, let, let's describe some numerical experiment. We start with a classical uh, regular Eisley square problem. You see. Here is a uh, <clears throat> least square formulation of uh, you want to solve x, a x minus b, which is ill posed. You, you take the uh, least square approach, minimization, and here's the regularization term, for example, which is for so sparsity or ticon of term, and so on. And uh, uh, we applied, uh, we, we are going to apply our. <coughs> our method with Vation, you see, uh, not directly to F because we develop a method with F, which is uh, uh, differentiable. Uh, what we did is just to replace F by its small envelope respect to a metric M, which is adopted to, <coughs> to A. Uh, so we consider this function, we apply our algorithm, you see, we inertial gradient algorithm Vation damping to this function FM which is here and which is convex and whose gradient is precisely uh, the proximal gradient operator you're interested with. That's a trick you see. Uh, so you, you do that, then you have a completely splitted uh, algorithm. You have just your evaluation of the, of, uh, the operator A in here's a proxy just self thresholding operator, for example. So it's completely free from an equal point of view. So these are basic elementary operation, very, very cheap for a numerical point of view. And here you have a convergence rate, you see one of a K square, fast convergence of a gradient. And uh, numerically, it's fantastic. You see uh, here is blue is the, the algorithm with the introduction of the Asian and it's far, completely, it's far better than FISTA. FISTA is in red, you see? Here is, we have quite uh, some kind of linear convergence, you see? So here is FISTA, here is our algorithm. So you have quite practically the same uh, numerical complexity and the method is far better. FISTA was, was already good, you see, but this method is, much better. And this is also valid from the group lasso, the TV uh, total variation. You have exactly the same picture, you see, very small oscillations. 
and uh, wrapped. Just to be complete, since uh, I am promoting this system, you have two uh, related systems to this, which are also interesting from a dynamical point of view. In fact, this system, you can rewrite it as a first order system. It's not the Hamiltonian formulation, since if you take the Hamiltonian formulation, you still have variation in the formulation. In fact, here you take advantage of the fact that each term comes uh, with its derivative. This term is the derivative of this one. This term is the derivative of this one. So in some sense, you can integrate the system with uh, other coefficient and you, you end up with a first order system in time and space. And this system is a linear perturbation, non-autonomous linear perturbation of a gradient system. You see, but it's not a gradient system. Okay? And the main interest of this formulation is that it makes sense even when F is non-smooth, non-convex, proper. This was used, for example, recently by Castera Bird Favor Powell and with application to deep learning. So they took advantage of, see, of the remarkable properties of the system to develop it in the case of uh, deep learning uh, problems. Um, it also, you see, because you F can be smooth, you, you and if F, for example, is the indicator function of a constraint, you, this system still makes sense when F is the indicator function of a system. In that case, you have just to, uh, to add some uh, uh, smooth driving force. And then you can, with this system, you can modelize dam shocks in mechanics. We, we, we applied this system to in there uh, differential equation and application. It's a journal of, uh, of PDEs. And we have successfully applied this kind of dynamical system in order to modelize dam shanks in mechanics with general restitution coefficient. So this is a very difficult problem to modelize dam shocks in mechanics uh, because you see, you have to modelize complex system which occur when, when there was a shock, you see it's instantaneous phenomena, you see, uh, you have to modelize this complex physics, which uh, I singularities and, um, okay. And you can do this with, with this uh, system, which is very remarkable. And another interesting approach to this system is done by Aleska Laszlo and Pinta, published in uh, Applied uh, Math Optimization 2020. They introduced this system, which is interesting because deviation, you have no more system, no more deviation, you see, but it's a gradient evaluated at this uh, vector. And in fact, we call this as implicit uh, form of our system because when t goes to infinity, x dot goes to zero. So if you perform the as Taylor asymptotic expansion of this term, you have this. So you recover our system. So this is more or less an implicit version of our system, which enjoys quite similar properties. Right, so now uh, let's come with, uh, okay, I, I can give you a two or three hours lecture. But <laughs> I, I come with another topic, which is very interesting, I think too. Because another drawback you see of, of the theorems I gave you before is that uh, uh, they provide you only weak convergence in general Hilbert space, weak convergence of the trajectories, and uh, you have convergence to an equilibria, to a, in the case convex optimization, in the case of uh, uh, convex optimization, you obtain a minimizer, but you don't know which minimizer you, you, you obtain, you see? For problems in uh, inverse problem, for example, in engineering, that's not too satisfactory because weak convergence means that, for example, of gradient means that you may have oscillation, you see, uh, space oscillations and uh, time and space oscillation. And you end up with a solution. You don't know what is the solution. In, for example, for inverse problem, it's very important to identify the solution you obtain. In general, you want to obtain which is as close to, as possible to a desired state. For example, you, you have a plane which already exists and you want to improve a plane. You don't want to create a completely new plane, even if it's 
complete optimal in many sense. You see, you want this improved plane to be close to the one you have at the beginning. So you are looking for a solution which is as close as possible to a given data. And uh, that's where uh, the idea of Tikhonov uh, come into play. So the idea is the following. Now we, we, we turn to, to, to Polyak in the strongly convex case, which is a very uh, good case, which means that F minus mu uh, square <coughs> is convex. In that case, you see the good dynamical system is by taking the damping of this, of this form. See, here is the same mu. Then you have exponential convergence. And when you consider a general function f, the idea is just to add a Tikhonov regularization term to f, but a Tikhonov regularization with a parameter which goes to zero. Again, something which goes to zero, since asymptotically we want to minimize f, we want, don't want to be too far from f. So we are going to consider this dynamical system, which is good for strongly convex function, and this function is strongly convex. So we consider this dynamical system, which is autonomous. Now we turn into a non-autonomous system where we replace f by ft. So if you replace f by ft, the gradient of ft is the gradient of f plus epsilon tx. And here, <coughs> the mu is epsilon of t. So square root of mu is square root of epsilon. So you end up with a system which is very interesting. And uh, the case of Nestorov, you see, uh, corresponds to alpha of t and here to c of t squared. So the important point is that, that here you have epsilon and here square root of epsilon. Here you take one over t squared and here you have one over t. <clears throat> and if you consider this system, you see, which can be seen as a perturbation of a preceding one. Then you obtain similar rate of convergence as in the Nestor case, plus this additional property, which is strong convergence to the minimum norm solution. Okay, minimum norm solution, because here we take x of t. If we take x of t minus x uh, desired, so you obtain the convergence to to uh, the solution which is as close to possible to the desired point, okay? And uh, so we have strong convergence instead of weak convergence, and the limit is not any solution, it's a solution with minimum norm. The point which is not completely satisfactory, it's, it's an open problem, very difficult open problem. We obtain this only with the lower limit. You see, we'd like to have a limit, but at this moment, we're only able to prove it with the lower limit, which is not too bad. You see, this means that there is a sequence going to infinity for which you have strong convergence to the minimum solution. In fact, we are going to able, we are able to prove a strong convergence of a good trajectory if for t large enough, the trajectory, there is a, a geometrical property, the trajectory stays either in this ball or in, it's incomplete. The critical case is when the, you have oscillation passing from this ball to, uh, to its complement. So we we'll guess that this is an oscillating uh, behavior, which is something exceptional, which means that we are confident that uh, <coughs> in practical situation, you have strong convergence to the minimum norm solution. You can take uh, uh, another damp type of regularization here, epsilon of t, square root of epsilon, and you have similar convergence rate. And um, so if we come on this result, the rate of convergence are comparable to the Nesterov. In addition, we have uh, property to the minimum source norm solution with comparable local complexity. You see the fast convergence of a value and strong convergence of a, to the solution of minimum are obtained for the same dynamic. It's the same dynamic. In previous work, quite recent, you see, in 2018, we obtained this property, but for a different dynamics obtained for a different setting of a parameter. So you have to change the dynamic in order to have each of these properties. Here, it's for the same dynamic. And I can tell you that the, the proof, the, the Tikhonov proof, 
is really difficult. You know, here are five to 10 pages of com difficult computation to obtain. The result is simple, you see, but the proof is really difficult. And uh, so you can replace the origin by any desired state. And uh, at this moment, we are developing the same kind of result for <coughs> the algorithm. Uh, for proximal, it's done, and for gradient, it's in progress, you see. The proof are not easy, so it takes time in order to develop this, uh, this result. Uh, I can speak for hours. I just say, uh, give you another idea, and then I stop. Uh, dry friction. See, up to now, we have been working with, let's say, viscous friction. Uh, either the identity or the Asian, but you have a matrix which acts on the velocity. And in mechanics, and this is the origin of the optimization property of this dynamical system, you see? Optimization property comes from the, the, the design of the damping term. In mechanics, there is another type of friction, which is maybe as important as the viscous friction, is the dry friction. Dry friction comes when you have, uh, for example, a ball which is moving on the, on the rough surface, see? See, not in the water, but on a rough surface. Right, and what is a dry friction potential? Is a potential which satisfies this, for example, think to phi of x equal some constant time the norm of x. So it's a sharp function with a sharp minimum at the origin. In the case of viscous friction, you see you have a smooth potential friction term, which is constant time the square of the norm. Square of the norm is smooth at the origin. Here we take a function which is non-smooth at the origin. And the key property, you see, when you come on with a discretization of a dynamics, you have a prox and the point is that the prox of a dry friction acts as a soft thresholding operator. You see, it makes to zero in a vector which is less than some value. This soft thresholding property plays a key role to show the finite time. Now we, we are not going to think about infinite, but finite time stabilization of algorithms. So you can introduce the damping here. I introduced dry friction in the pre previous dynamics, okay? And here you have finite time stabilization of the di uh, dynamics. And I insist on this one, which is a very recent one. It's a paper which, is, uh, which has just been sent for publication. It's not still published. It's something very interesting the preceding dynamics, but here the friction acts, the dry friction acts on the sum of the velocity vector and the gradient of F. And what's very interesting with this dynamical system, so it's, it converge in the context case, it converge and its limit is a minimizer of F. In the non-convex case where F is non-convex, F is a, semi-algebraic function, you have exactly the same property. You have convergence to a critical point of F. So it converge, whatever F is, okay? You have interesting property. And what's very interesting is that this system tolerates, because of the of a fresh sub thresholding property, I mentioned you, this convergence property tolerates errors which are only supposed to tend towards zero. Up to now, all the results I know concerning the perturbation of dynamical system, they tell you that you can introduce errors if these errors go sufficiently fast to zero in the dynamics. For the EV ball, you have at the summation of the errors if it's to zero, uh, finite. For Nesterov, you have sigma of k, uh, the norm of ak is finite and so on. Here you have just to assume that the error goes to zero. So this makes, in my opinion, this makes this system a very promising tool in order to attack a problem with errors and stochastic data. Right, so uh, for example, here is 
comparison with an STROF, in STROF, we take, take an, an error which has a, a magnitude of over one over K. In the case of Nestroff, in green, you have a very bad behavior, and here our all algorithm that will converge without any problem. Here is a performance profile of the algorithm. Right, so I can talk for you for, <coughs> for hours. We have been extending this result in case of ADMM, but we have linear constraints. We have extended that to a case of monotone inclusions. We have extended that <coughs> to the case of uh, uh, non-convex optimization based on the kurdikalo yazevich theory. And uh, right, so it's a rule. Of, this is a rule lecture, you see. I just stopped and <coughs> want to finish with some perspective. So uh, we've introduced a dynamical perspective on accelerated optimization algorithm, which <coughs> Passing through uh, dynamical system has uh, allowed us to, to understand from a mathematical point of view the nature of accelerated gradient method. And by the way, uh, provides several improvements. And <clears throat> among these improvements, we have convergence of the trajectories in the iterates. This is still an open question for the historical version of Nestorov. We have been able to improve the convergence rate. passing from capital O to small o and obtain a fast convergence of the gradients. Uh, <clears throat> introducing the geometrical damping to even variation, uh, which is something which is not present in Nestor. You see, Nestor is really based on the classical uh, viscous damping. This allows us to reduce the oscillation. We keep the same convergence rate and without uh, any additional numerical cost. And introducing a Tikhon of the vanishing coefficient allows us to pass from weak to strong convergence and to select a particular solution. And we still, we have the same convergence rate. You see no uh, numerical uh, additional complexity. So in some sense, these are free. And uh, <clears throat> OK, and uh, at this moment, we are, we are working on the inexact and stochastic version of this uh, uh, algorithm, you see, in the same way as the classical gradient method has been developed in the setting of the stochastic gradient method. Here, it's very tempting to develop this tool in the stochastic case, and I'm very confident about that. This is something which is ongoing. If you like a mathematical challenge, I have a few of them, which formulation is very simple, but in my opinion, these are very difficult problem. So here is the Nestorov algorithm. Do we have convergence in the case alpha equal three? You see, the question is very simple, but at this moment, we have only a positive answer in one dimension. In one dimension, because really of a, a geometry, you have no, no freedom in the geometry of a problem. We have been able to prove a convergence in one dimension by Nestorov that from dimension two, we don't know if the trajectory do converge. Uh, we claim that it's interesting to take the parameter alpha greater than three, but we don't know how, what's a good choice for alpha. Uh, numerical experience tell us that you have to take alpha greater than three, but no general rule. Some take alpha equal to four, 10, 50. You don't know what, can you say something about uh, clever about uh, how to choose the parameter alpha, except that taking greater than three? Another interesting question which puzzled me is: uh, uh, in order to obtain this rate of convergence, we had to grow through uh, non-autonomous dynamics. Okay, because we have a vanishing damping coefficient, we have to go through non-autonomous dynamics. So the, my question is, is it possible to obtain this rate of convergence with a continuous dynamics, a continuous autonomous dynamics? So it's a problem of control theory, you see? Can you find a, a closed loop damping which provides you uh, this rate of convergence? I think that's a very interesting problem and in my opinion, uh, difficult. And for Tikhon of regularization, I mentioned that the fact that we have been able to obtain only a convergence with the Lima half. 
So it will be nice to obtain the convergence with the limit. And for the inertial ADMM algorithm, I have no time to talk about that. Uh, we have been able to obtain the convergence rate uh, by just like Nestor of one of the k-square for the values, but at this moment, we have not convergence of each rates. Convergence of each rate is something very difficult because we have inertial method and we are in the setting of maximal monotone operator. In that case, proving the convergence of the trajectory is something very difficult. So these are simple problems, and uh, I think it would be very nice to have some progress on the equation in the coming years. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, go I have ahead. one question. Thank you very much, Monsieur uh, Matouche, for the uh, nice talk and informative uh, slides. Um, I have only one question. Um, in your paper, one of your papers, you said the uh, uh, nested of uh, convergence rate is not actually uh, inverse Q square, is inverse cubic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is that uh, right or is it a different? So, um, I mean, the uh, continuous dynamical system, does it reveal uh, some hidden facts from the discrete uh, analysis? No, I think they are quite parallel. It's the same result. In continuous and discrete case, you have the same. In effect, <clears throat> when, with the introduction of the Asian, you have that in the discrete case, the sum of uh, k square gradient of f at xk norm square is finite. Okay? And this gives you, uh, uh, let's say, a, <clears throat> a convergence for the infimum of a gradient. It gives you uh, a cubic uh, convergence. And, uh, and in the continuous case, it's the same. You see, the, the, the Lyapunov function, the Lyapunov analysis is quite parallel in the continuous and discrete case. Mm, I see, I see. But uh, you said the optimal convergence rate is a uh, inverse a square. Yeah. But uh, from your paper, one of your papers, I think in 2016, you said uh, uh, it's actually faster. Yeah, yeah, it's faster, it's, it's small o. You see? Uh, I see, I see, okay. In Nesterov, uh, people say it's capital o, o of one of a k square. And people believe that this was optimal because of the result of uh, Nemirovsky and Udin. But in fact, we prove that uh, instead of capital O of one of a K square, you have small O of one of a K square. And if you look carefully of the formulation of uh, uh, optimality condition of Nemirovsky and Udin, it's not con contradictory, you see? I see, I see. It's a quite technical discussion. We can return on it, but, see, but the formulation of the uh, optimality condition is, is quite, uh, you see, there exists a convex function such that not for all k, but k has to be less than n minus one over two, and n is the dimension of a space, you see? And okay. <clears throat> so it's not for all k. So, in fact, this is not contradictory with our result since our result is true. <laughs> I, <guess. laughs> I see, I see. No, you, I, have small o, you have small yeah, yeah. O one over k square, and this uh, is not contradictory with this result. Yeah, I see. Just uh, wanted to check whether uh, continuous dynamics reveals some uh, hidden facts. Because uh, the discretization step, we can have, um, I mean, first, we can have uh, many uh, equivalent uh, continuous dynamical systems that represent the same uh, algorithm. Yeah, yeah, but Dep that... depending on linearization and uh, discretization. Yeah, but uh, it, it was for for the next, for for this algorithm. You see, for the for the that's what the algorithm considered. You see. Yeah, yeah. Alpha equal three. For alpha strictly than three, you have convergence small o of one over k square. So, that's, so, so Nesterov is alpha equal three. If you replace three by 
3.1, you pass from capital O to small O of one over K squared for this algorithm. That's just right. what we say. I see, I see. Thank you very much. Thanks. Other questions? I, I have a small question or a remark. So thank you for the, for the great talk. Um, so you asked the question whether we can find an autonomous system uh, that achieves accelerated convergence in the convex case, uh, if I understand it correctly. So, but what, what I have in mind is that you can find, at least in continuous time, you can find the differential equations, which is, which is autonomous, and both solutions decay as one over T. And you could use that to get an autonomous, autonomous differential equation that has the same type of damping. So it, it depends a bit what, yeah, I just wanted to comment that. Yeah, yeah, yes. I, I know a little bit your paper. In fact, it's a very interesting paper. And uh, just, but I, I was just thinking of, uh, you see, uh, I know, but your formulation, you see, of uh, closed loop damping is, is a little bit complicated, you see. I was thinking. Yeah, you need a square. You need a square, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was thinking for something more simpler, just taking a function you see of a velocity or something like that. See, mm -hmm. you take a x dot dot plus, mm -hmm. and you find mm -hmm. some function if you take the subdifferential of uh, phi at x dot. Uh, can you find a function phi, phi such that you have one over k square? I, yeah, it's an interesting the question. The answer is, is not, uh, it's, it will be interesting, you see, to know a very function phi, you see, for which you, you can, uh, um, we try to do that, and so it's an intuition, but I think maybe you, you have an answer, but maybe there are some others, and the point would be to find the simplest way, you see, to, to do that. But I know and, you, and, you, you, you have a nice question. <laughs> and and the, the other question uh, I, I wanted to ask, have you thought about a case, say, for example, we look at a strongly convex function, but we don't know the condition number. Have you, have you thought about this case? Is there anything we can do or, or is there simply nothing? Uh, like, yeah. You know, whether, whether you would try to estimate the condition know. number at, at the same time as you do the optimization. Mm. See, when something is unknown, you see, it's, it's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no, no, what I claim is, okay, my, my intuition, you see, is you play with the geometry of a function, the damping and the, and the, and the rate of convergence. If you have one of the three you don't know, it's, <laughs> things become difficult. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. But that's interesting. Yeah. But uh, at this moment, I have no special idea on that. All right, any uh, other questions? All right, thank you, Heidi, again for the nice, uh, very nice talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to introduce our next uh, speaker. Uh, yeah, if you could uh, start sharing your screen. Oh, I got perfect. Yeah. Do you do you see the, yeah. the presentation? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. All right then. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Michael, for the accepting the invitation. So, our, Michael, moving back, we'll be talking about optimization with momentum, dynamical control theoretic, and the symplectic perspectives. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so thank you very much for for inviting me and, and having me here. And it's really an honor for me to 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 be here and, and present my research. And I must say that uh, I, there's really not too much I can add because. Uh, Professor Atush already already uh, provided us <laughs> so much so much knowledge uh, about uh, about optimization with momentum, but I will try to to my best to to maybe illustrate some of the points uh, from a different angle, uh, and I hope that that you find this fruitful. Yeah. So today I I will talk about optimization with momentum, and so I will present some of my uh, work that I did uh, while I was uh, postdoc with uh, Mike Jordan uh, at UC Berkeley. 
So why do we care about optimization? Um, I think on the fundamental level, optimization provides a framework for, for rational decision making. And as a result, I'm convinced that optimization will continue and is driving and will drive uh, science, engineering and, and technology. And so here's, here's uh, three examples where, where optimization could be important or is important. In uh, computer-aided diagnosis, uh, medical doctors are supported by machine learning algorithms and, and these are uh, trained with, with optimization. In air traffic control, you could use optimization to schedule flights and to mitigate uh, the propagation of delays. Um, and, and this could also, uh, and you could use this also to, to reduce CO2 emissions. And in statistical inference, you would like to fit empirical observations to a statistical model, and this leads to an optimization problem. Now, I, I did my uh, PhD in control engineering, um, and I used optimization a lot uh, to make uh, dynamical systems behave the way uh, I wanted. Um, and so here's, here's a couple of examples. So together with a student, we try to push uh, the envelope of what's doable uh, with a quadrotor. And so we used optimization and, and machine learning techniques uh, to perform this flip. Uh, so I hope, I hope you can see the video. It's, it's a bit shaky in, in my presentation, but yeah, otherwise you can go to my website and you can have a look at the video there. Um, I also worked on this flying vehicle. So this flying vehicle uh, consists of uh, three electric ducted fans. And um, uh, yeah, and, and uh, it, it weighs about eight kilograms and we used thrust vectoring to control the attitude. And the, the problem is that uh, the, the thrust vectoring is very limited. So the, the thrust vectoring is uh, done by moving these control flaps. So let me have my pointer. So by moving these control flaps and these can only be moved in a certain amount. And you can use optimization-based control. So you can formulate these constraints with optimization very naturally. And so you can account these uh, and, and you can exploit this to uh, perform uh, very, uh, to, to execute flight maneuvers and, and to have a good tracking performance, for example. Um, I also used optimization for, for uh, controlling, controlling this system here. So, so this system has uh, three reaction wheels, which are mounted orthogonally. And each of these uh, reaction wheels is actuated by a mechanical, by an electrical motor. And attached to each wheels, there's also a mechanical braking system, similar to a bicycle brake. And what you can do is you can speed up the wheels at high angular uh, rates and then suddenly brake by using the, the, the mechanical brakes. And so the system will jump up. And uh, the, the task where we used optimization was to determine the initial wheel speeds so that after braking, uh, we would end up in, in an upright, upright equilibrium. So close to the upright equilibrium so that we can turn on the feedback controller. And so what we did is a, a sort of uh, iterative procedure where we would do, would do approximate Newton steps. And so we could, we could essentially learn on the real system the right initial wheel speeds. Yeah, so these are all examples where, where optimization is, is very effective. Um, and so I, I would like to, to point to some of the challenges. Well, I think for me, one of the main challenges is how can we make algorithms scalable to very, very high dimensions. And from an analysis point of view, what makes, what makes the analysis uh, of an optimization algorithm uh, uh, difficult is that the algorithm has not only to perform well on a single function, but on a whole class of functions. And so this introduces me to, to my talk. So today uh, I would like to talk about uh, optimization with momentum and I would like to uh, uh, essentially understand or provide you some intuition about this phenomenon of acceleration. And I think um, it's best explained by looking at some empirical results. So on the left, I randomly uh, generated a quadratic function and I applied uh, an accelerated gradient method and the gradient method. So I use here um, the version from uh, Nesterov with a constant step size um, and as you can see, the accelerated gradient method uh, beats the gradient method by roughly one order of magnitude in, in terms of uh, number of iterations. And so that's, that's a, a huge speed up. And if you use this in machine learning, this could make the difference between uh, waiting for your for algorithm to converge 
with respect, either you have to wait for a day or, or it could reduce the, the training time to, to a couple of hours. So I, I think it's very important to, to study this phenomenon carefully. And so let me introduce some, some mathematical setup. Um, and so in contrast to uh, what, what Professor Atosh uh, showed us, um, I will focus on the case where we have non-degenerate uh, local minima. So we, where the curvature doesn't vanish. So, so in other words, strongly convex functions. And so, and, and there we can operate with, with time invariant systems and it makes the analysis and, and the interpretation, I think a little bit easier. And, and that's why I, I, I would like to illustrate these results. Okay, so I'm interested in optimizing this function f. Um, so I'm trying to find the minimizer x star um, that, that minimizes this function f. And initially I will, I'll focus on the case where f is smooth and strongly convex. Uh, so smooth means that the gradient is Lipschitz continuous and strongly convex means that it, it satisfies this inequality. And as you probably know, the, the um, coefficient kappa here, uh, that's called the condition number. And so what's the interpretation of, of this condition number? Well, if kappa is close to one, this means that the function f has round level sets. So the, the function f looks very much the same in, in every direction. If kappa is very large, this means that the level sets are, are, can be very distorted. And L here, the constant L will be the Lipschitz constant of the gradient. And, and these two constants will, will be important. And we'll see that uh, many of the results uh, that I will do uh, are essentially of a local nature and they will translate to a non-convex setting uh, very easily. Okay, and so with, with the notation in place, we can return to, to uh, the empirical results that I showed you. So I can now state both algorithms that I used. I have gradient descent on top and then the accelerated version. So the version with a constant step size uh, from Professor Nesterov. And uh, yeah, and, and one particular or, or one important or interesting feature is that here you evaluate the, the gradient of, the, of f, not at qk, but at a position which is slightly off. And you have these two constants, d and beta, which are chosen according to, to kappa. Okay, and we know from, from uh, convex optimization that uh, gradient descent converges linearly. Uh, where the rate scales with one over kappa. And this is in sharp contrast to accelerated gradient descent, where we also converge linearly, but where the rate scales with the square root of kappa. And so, and this explains essentially the result that we see, uh, we see on the left. Uh, because as you can imagine, if kappa is say a hundred uh, or a thousand, it makes a huge difference whether your, your rate scales with the square root of kappa or, or with kappa. And so in the following, what I would like to answer is I would like to answer the question, when do we have an algorithm that converges with the square root as opposed to, to one over kappa? And maybe to, to relate that to, to the talk that we saw earlier. So in the case, the function f is not uh, strongly convex, then we obtain these sublinear uh, convergence rates. So we would have one over t uh, in the case of gradient descent and one over t squared in the case of accelerated gradient descent. And again, uh, I like to, to mention this quote from Arkady Nemirovsky who said, let me add some words about the Nesterov method as it is, it looks like an analytical trick. I would be happy to present you a geometrical explanation, but I don't know it. And so this really points to the fact that understanding um, really these momentum-based algorithms is, is a non-trivial uh, task. And so this is the, the outline of, of my talk. Uh, so first I would like to provide you an interpretation of, of, this, of this algorithm here. Uh, and then, and in particular, I would like to, to uh, emphasize how to transition from a continuous time representation to discrete time. And I would like to provide you a very quick uh, interpretation of, of why it would make sense to evaluate this, this gradient at this position, which is slightly off. And then in the second step, I would like to uh, characterize more broadly the mechanism that leads to acceleration. And, and one of the questions I would like to ask is, is there a straightforward way with which we can characterize uh, the convergence rate? 
And finally, if there's, if there's time, I uh, would like to uh, provide you also some of my thoughts on, on lower bounds uh, from, from the dynamical systems point of view. Okay, and so what we can do is uh, we, can, we can come up with this uh, ordinary differential equation. And if you, if you take this differential equation and you discretize it uh, with the semi-implicit order scheme, you will end up the methods that I showed you earlier. So exactly. So if you stay, take a time step t equals one, you end up with the methods that I showed you earlier. And so I would like to provide you a quick interpretation of both uh, the ODE and the discretization. And uh, as, as was uh, mentioned in the audience, I think it's very important to, to really uh, consider both. So you, you might be able to come up with different continuous time interpretations, uh, but it's really the connection with the discretization that, that pro probably provides you additional understanding, understanding of, of the discrete algorithm that you're, you're implementing at the end. Okay, and so what's the interpretation of this differential equation? Well, you can, you can, you can add, uh, you can define Q as your generalized coordinate, P as your generalized momentum, and then you can view it as a mass spring damper system where essentially you have the spring force here so the gradient of F that could correspond to a spring. So the spring potential would be the objective function. And then the, the, the gradient would be the, the spring force. And then there's the damping terms, uh, which, are, which are given by this formula here. And what's the interpretation of the, of the damping terms? Um, and this very much uh, relates to what Professor Atush told us about uh, the Hessian, Hessian driven damping term. So we can divide these damping terms into two parts. One part is just a constant times the momentum, and one part is a local average uh, of the curvature, so of the Hessian here. And I think it's interesting to note that this uh, local average depends on this constant beta and depends on this velocity uh, p. So the faster we move, the, the larger the momentum p, um, the, the larger is the interval over which we take, take this average. And we, we have these constants d and beta that balance uh, these two terms. And if we look back, back at this, uh, at the, the, mes the method from Nesterov, the constant step size method, then it turns out that these two coefficients, d and beta, are related to kappa in the following way. So, so the graph is shown here. And what this means is that for kappa close to one, uh, 2d is one. And so the emphasis lies, lies on this isotropic damping term. And this makes a lot of sense because if we're dealing uh, with kappa equals one, we, it means that we have essentially a, a, a function that looks the same in every direction. And so there's no need to introduce uh, this curvature dependent damping term. But as we increase kappa, the, the emphasis changes and, and the, the 2D uh, essentially goes to zero and beta goes to one. And so the emphasis lies on this uh, curvature dependent damping term. Okay, and in continuous time, if we if we ask the question, are are the trajectories uh, so so are uh, local minima uh, stable? Then this is a very uh, straightforward question to answer in continuous time. We can we can simply look at how the energy function evolves, and we easily conclude that essentially along the trajectories of, of this ordinary differential equation, energy is dissipated. And we can then in, in, invoke LaSalle's theorem to conclude that local minima are asymptotically stable. So, so this works for the convex setting, but also for a non-convex setting. In the non-convex setting, we'll have to bound, bound this term to ensure that energy is really dissipated along trajectories. But the, the argument is the same. OK, and now, so that's the continuous time interpretation. Now let's uh, talk about the discretization. And so you can take this semi-implicit Euler scheme and apply it to the ordinary differential equation and you'll obtain uh, the, the original method. And one interpretation of the scheme is the following. So you can divide the scheme into two parts um, and these two parts are applied consecutively. So essentially one step of in, in the above equation corresponds to the concatenation of this step and this step. And the first part of the step, you can think of this as energy dissipation. 
So you simply update the momentum coordinates with the non-potential forces, with the damping forces. And the important part is that second part here, this is, relies only on the conservative part of the dynamics. So on the, on the, yeah, on the conservative part of, of these continuous time dynamics. And it's a very well-known integration scheme. It's called the sim symplectic order step. Um, and what this symplectic order step does, it, it preserves the Hamiltonian properties. And so we'll, we'll exploit this fact and we can um, essentially come up with a modified energy function that is uh, almost exactly preserved over this step. And then we can use this modified energy function for stability analysis, much in the same way as we used the original energy function uh, for the stability analysis in continuous time. So, so just to reiterate the, the fact that we have this concatenation between dissipation and a symplectic step, and the fact that the step is symplectic and is based only on the conservative part of the dynamics, we can, we can use that to, to come up with, with a modified energy function that essentially plays the role, role of, of uh, that, that can be viewed as an in, in the analogy of, of the energy function in continuous time. Yeah. And I think again, this, this provides a, a nice interpretation to why this discretization scheme is, is uh, useful or, or sensible. Yeah. Okay, and so, so this brings me uh, to, the, to the second part of my talk. Uh, now I would like to characterize more broadly uh, what leads to this fast, uh, fast convergence. So what's the role of these two constants? How should we choose these? And, and is there uh, the evaluation of this gradient at the shifted position uh, really needed? And so also uh, let me know if you have uh, questions, uh, you, you feel free to, to interrupt me uh, and, and to ask. Yeah. Otherwise I will just go on. Okay, and in order to carry out the convergence rate analysis, uh, I, would, I would exploit uh, a dynamical systems point of view on, on optimization. And I think what's interesting about this point of view is that in, in dynamical systems, we typically distinguish between stability analysis and analysis of convergence rates. And so that's, uh, that's what I would like in the, in the following. So what do I mean with, with stability? So let's look at this uh, convex function, uh, non-convex function here that has two local minima. And in the video here, uh, I sample different initial conditions. Um, and as you can see, depending on where we start, uh, we converge to, to either the left local minima or the right local minima. And if we add some more trajectories, we, we get the following picture. And now by, by the stability question, I mean, can we identify um, uh, parts of the region of attraction of either, either of these equilibria? And when we operate in continuous time, uh, what we can do, because we know that the energy, energy is dissipated along trajectories, we can, we can simply look at the level sets uh, of, of the energy function. And so, so the idea is that if you, if you initialize your system, for example, uh, at this point, your, your energy level is too low so that you can, you, you, you're trapped in this valley. And so you'll certainly be trapped in this valley and because energy is dissipated, you're guaranteed to converge uh, to this point here. And similarly, if you start uh, in, in the right valley and your energy function, your, your energy is low enough, you'll be trapped in this right valley and, and you'll converge to this, to this equilibrium here on the, on the right. And so how can you characterize the regions, uh, the, the regions of attraction? Well, you can look at uh, the energy level set that's given when you evaluate the, evalu uh, the, the energy function at the saddle point. And this divides uh, the state space in these two parts. And you know that if you initialize your, your trajectories on the left, you will converge to this equilibrium. If you initialize your system on the right, you will converge here. And so this answers uh, the, the stability question to some extent. You, you just have to analyze. I mean, this is easier uh, said than done, but in theory, you could analyze the energy function and you could approximate the regions of attraction of each equilibrium. And 
So now that we have stability, how can we analyze uh, the rate? And so pictorially, what we, or what we would like to do is we would like to bound uh, the, the current iterate uh, with respect or the distance of the current iterate um, to uh, the local, local optimum that we, that we know is asymptotically stable. Uh, and we bound that by essentially distance at, at the initial point times a constant and times something which decays exponentially. And we're, we're, op we're operating with strongly complex functions, so we have this exponential decay. And uh, what I will focus on is I will focus on identifying this alpha here. And now let's, let's consider these examples. So we have certain trajectories here. So, so I just simulated uh, so, some trajectories. And so the task is to find uh, such, a, such a bound. And if we look at the time interval from zero to five seconds, we could maybe come up with, with such a bound. So C equals 2.5 and alpha equals 0 0.2. But we can also scale up C and scale up alpha. And this would also lead to a valid bound. And so if we, if we only look at this uh, interval from zero to five seconds. And so what we conclude from this very simple uh, faults is we conclude that this alpha is essentially determined by very large T. So very large T determine uh, the, the, this alpha. But for very large T, because we know that we started in the region of attraction of, of an equilibrium, then we know that for very large T, trajectories are arbitrarily close to the equilibrium. And so we can perform a linear analysis to determine uh, this rate alpha. And so to, to put, to summarize these faults, the global shape of the objective function determines the stability properties, the regions of attraction, but the local shape of the objective function determines the convergence rate if we, if we don't care about the C. And this is the corresponding uh, formal, formal statement. Um, so let's assume we have dynamics that are twice continuously differentiable. We have an equilibrium uh, that is asymptotically stable with a certain region of, region of attraction. And we have, we have uh, a linearization of the dynamics that converges exponentially with a certain constant. And this could be continuous time or discrete time dynamics, it doesn't matter. Then what we can say is that for any compact set uh, in the region of attraction, we'll find a modified constant so that the nonlinear dynamics uh, converge at, at the same rate alpha. And the way, the way this statement works is essentially it ex exploits the fact that trajectories are continuously dependent on their initial condition. And so the, the argument, if we summarize the argument roughly, it's, it's very elementary. You, you exploit the fact that you have a continuous dependence of uh, trajectories on, on the initial condition over a finite time interval. And you exploit the fact that A is compact. And these two properties together, you can exploit, you can can conclude from these two properties that there exists a finite time until you reach a, a, a very small neighborhood of, of uh, the, the equilibrium. And once it, you're in this small neighborhood, your, your convergence is given by, by the first order approximation, so by the linearization. OK, and I think that, in, in a sense, this allows us to, to de decouple the stability question and, and the rate question. And in continuous time, we, we argued that stability is, is very easily obtained if we, if we look at uh, how energy is dissipated so, or, or if we guarantee that energy is dissipated along trajectories. And then if we want to determine the rate, we can simply look at the linearization uh, and calculate the eigenvalues. And now for, for uh, this differential equation that I showed you, the eigenvalues are given by this expression here. And there's this parameter h, uh, which denotes uh, the, the local curvature. So, so the Hessian uh, of the objective function evaluate, evaluated at the local, at the, uh, local equilibrium or, or local minimum. And if we assume, for example, that uh, the function f is locally strongly convex, so this means that this constant h is lower and upper bounded, then what we need to do is we need to analyze how do these eigenvalues change as we vary this parameter h. And in, we, can, we can distinguish several different cases. 
in case beta is equal to zero, uh, we can distinguish uh, a small damping and the large damping regimes. If the damping is small, then the eigenvalues will be uh, complex conjugate. And uh, as we vary this parameter h, essentially we change the imaginary part. So the eigenvalues uh, will move up or down the imaginary axis. Uh, but if the damping is too large, then the eigenvalues meet here and they become real. And so we conclude that if the damping is too small or if the damping is too large, then we cannot have a convergence rate that scales with the square root of kappa. And a very similar picture is obtained if, if we look at the case where beta is not equal to zero. So remember beta was this coefficient that uh, uh, essentially controls where to evaluate the gradient. And what this parameter beta does, it adds some uh, additional negative real part for larger values of h. And again, if the damping is too little or the damping is too large, uh, we, we can guarantee that there's no, no acceleration. And so, so this is the result. Essentially, for a large set of parameters, as long as these parameters satisfy the scaling condition, uh, we have uh, a convergence rate that is accelerated, meaning that it scales with the square root uh, of kappa. And one important thing to notice is that from this result, it follows that for, for large kappa, so when kappa becomes larger and larger, uh, the damping vanishes. And this will be this corner case where the damping vanishes will be very important uh, for the discretization. And, and that's what we uh, will analyze next. So in discrete time, we'll, we'll do the same analysis, the same type of analysis, and we'll exploit the fact that we have this concatenation between dissipation and energy conservation with respect to a modified energy function. So we, we have this symplectic integration. And the important corner case to consider is when kappa becomes larger and larger because then this part reduces to the identity map. And then all we're, we're left with in continuous time, we're left with a Hamiltonian system. And then the discretization is very delicate because if, if we have an, a system that conserves energy and we just discretize it in any arbitrary way, it's very easy to, to add, uh, to, to leak in or, or to uh, have an energy consistency. So which would make, for example, the energy increase uh, over, over the different steps. And, and this could even lead to instability. But the fact that we have the symplectic discretization ensures that we're, we're doing the right thing, either, even in case where the, van, uh, where the damping vanishes. Yeah. And we can use the fact that this is a symplectic uh, scheme to, to come up with a perturbed energy function. So that's uh, the statement here. Uh, we can come up with a perturbed energy function uh, that is exactly or almost exactly preserved over, over one uh, step of this uh, symplectic Euler uh, uh, scheme. And so let, so phi t here uh, denotes one of this symplectic Euler step. And the bounds that we obtain is, is uh, given here. So we obtain something with t e to the minus something divided by t. And the, the important thing is that we have an exponent here where, where we have a constant divided by t. And if t is small, for example, 0 0.01, but the important thing is that t is independent of kappa. But if t, we can choose t small, and then this becomes extremely small. So 10 to the minus 33, for example. And so for, for the remaining part of the analysis, I will just uh, neglect this term. And I will say that this is uh, often done in, in numerical analysis. Um, and and uh, parts of, of why, why this uh, result is interesting is also because we were able to derive bounds here that, that characterize uh, essentially the difference between uh, this perturbed energy function and the original energy function. And we'll use these bounds for stability analysis. And so in, in, in a way this provides by exploiting uh, the property of the discretization, we're able to come up with this uh, modified energy function with backwards error analysis. And this provides us with a principled way of, of designing, designing this modified energy function, which we'll use to, to uh, argue about stability. Yeah, 
So, so in order to, to do a stability analysis, we can now use this perturbed energy function much in the same way as we used the original energy function uh, in, in order to guarantee that uh, trajectories converge, converge to local minima. Um, and then we can, uh, we can use the proposition that I showed you earlier. Uh, once we have stability local uh, asymptotic, uh, sorry, once we have asymptotic stability of local minima, uh, we can look, we can characterize the rate by, by looking at the realization, uh, which is given by, by this expression here. And in discrete time, because we're now operating in discrete time, we have to look at the magnitude of these eigenvalues. Uh, but the conclusions are, are very much, uh, are very similar to the continuous time case. And, and we conclude that as long as these parameters satisfy the scaling condition, essentially we have, we have a, a convergence rate that scales uh, with the square root of kappa. And one, I, at least for me, one interesting uh, corollary of this, of this result is that in fact, we don't need this evaluation of the gradient at this shifted position. So we can choose D equals one over square root of kappa and beta equals to zero. And this would satisfy the scaling condition. And we obtain the, the heavy ball algorithm uh, as shown here. And we can show that this is accelerated at least if we choose the time T uh, small enough. But the importance here is that T is chosen small but independent of kappa. And, and yeah, so we conclude that uh, this evaluation of the gradient at the shifted position is not necessarily needed if we only care about uh, the fact that the rate scales with the square root, square root of kappa. Okay, and, and this brings me to the last part uh, of my talk. Uh, now that I tried to, to illustrate some of the aspects leading to, to uh, or making certain algorithms converge converge quicker or having this nice scaling property uh, with for, for ill-conditioned problems, uh, I would like to share some, some thoughts on, on lower bounds. Um, and so the motivation is that, well, we saw that many algorithms have continuous time limits. Many of these discrete optimization algorithms have, have uh, continuous time limits. And the question is now, are there, and we know that there's fundamental uh, convergence limits in, in discrete time. The question is now, can we, are there also uh, convergence limits in continuous time? And so on the left, I showed you some, some trajectories that, that I obtained uh, by applying heavy ball, nester off or, or gradient descent. And so, so the question would be, well, uh, what, what, are, what are the limits? What is the fastest that we can achieve? And just to review, uh, let's look quickly at, at how uh, lower bounds are constructed in discrete time for, for strongly complex functions. Well, we, we assume a gradient oracle. So we assume at each iteration, we get access to the gradient. And uh, the, the way the lower bound is corrected, uh, constructed in, in discrete time is to come up with a function that is very difficult to optimize. And it's surprisingly enough, it's, it's enough to choose a quadratic. Um, and th the way this quadratic is chosen is that if you initialize the algorithm properly, then at each iteration, at, at the jth iteration, all the gradients that, that the algorithm, algorithm has seen so far are constrained to a subspace. So in, in exactly, precisely speaking to a j plus one dimensional subspace at iteration j. And the way we construct the lower bound is now to ensure that the subspace is far away uh, from, from the optimum, from, from the minimum. And we achieve this by increasing the, the uh, dimension of the problem without, without bounds. And, and this leads then to this uh, uh, lower bound here. And this concludes that the lower bound, uh, the complexity of of if we want to optimize strongly complex functions with a gradient oracle scales with the square root of kappa, which, which recovers, uh, yeah. And so the question I would like to, to uh, discuss with you here is, are there lower bounds also in continuous time? And I would like to approach this problem uh, from, from a different angle and provide you that we can, we can come up with essentially a constructive approach where we explicitly incorporate uh, the invariance properties of the function class at, whole, at, at, at hand. 
Um, and we can then also exploit the local analysis and recover uh, essentially this, this lower bound that we obtained also in discrete time. Okay, and so if we want to discuss lower bounds, uh, there's, we have to first uh, fix certain things. So we have to fix the function class that, that uh, we think of. And we also have to define what, what we consider to be an optimization algorithm. And so what I will do is I'll look at functions which has, have Lipschitz continuous gradients. I'll assume that the local minimum is at zero and that F, the function, the objective function is twice uh, continuously differentiable. Uh, and the class of functions that we'll consider are essentially strongly convex functions. But here I'll, I'll formulate it a bit differently because I would like to, to emphasize the geometrical uh, uh, assumptions that, that, that lie at the heart uh, of, of this function class. So we'll assume that we have a local curvature which is upper and lower bounded by these constants mu and L. And we assume that this function class is invariant under orthogonal transformations. And okay, so that uh, that's, uh, fixes the class of functions that we, we consider. Now, what do we con uh, consider to be an optimization algorithm in continuous time? And I think a natural way to design or to, to uh, define an optimization algorithm in continuous time is to view it as a feedback system. And so the design of an optimization algorithm, you could view it as the design of this dynamical system here where u is the input and y is the output. And k here denotes k derivative. So that means k derivative with respect to time. Um, and when you would like to optimize a function, you would put it in feedback. So you would evaluate the gradient of f at y and choose that as, as your input. And in this free time, you could view this uh, differentiation operation as a as delay, the cave delay operator. And so in discrete time, this will mean that at each iteration you choose, uh, you evaluate the gradient at y one time, exactly one time. And for, for this uh, system to make sense, we, we need to make certain assumptions on, on, on g and h. And so, so the assumptions that we will make is that uh, the critical points of, uh, the objective function, so, so the points where the gradient vanishes, correspond to equilibria. The second assumption will be that local minima correspond to asymptotically stable equilibria, and that G and H satisfy a time normalization constraint. And I will uh, now motivate and illustrate all, all these, these three assumptions. So the first is critical points correspond to equilibria. Well, what this does is essentially what we want to uh, impose is that the algorithm should not, should stay where it is if the gradient vanishes. So we have no way of distinguishing between saddle points, maxima or minima. So whenever the gradient vanishes, we should just stay because it, it might as well be a local minimum. And so we, we only move or, or uh, ha have a positive velo or, or have a non-zero velocity when the gradient is non-zero. And then the second assumption is that local minima correspond to stable equilibria or to asymptotically stable equilibria. So meaning that if we initialize our algorithm close enough to, to a local minimum, we should converge. Um, and again, I believe that these two points are essentially uh, minimal requirements on, on any dynamical, in order to call the dynamical systems to, to optimize a function f. Now, what about the third assumption, this, this time normalization constraint? And, and this is specific to continuous time. So in continuous time, let's, let's look at this trajectory X of T here, uh, this uh, continuous time solution that, that might arise as a solution of this ordinary differential equation for uh, the function G and H uh, fixed. And what we can do, we can just uh, let time evolve twice as fast. So we can rescale twice at a time, for example, by a factor of two. And then this, this trajectory would essentially look, look like this. Uh, and we would have uh, the conversions, which would be twice as fast. But if we look at the trajectories in the phase space, we realize that even though we, we rescale time, they, they remain unchanged. So if we want to have a, a sort of absolute meaning of, of convergence rate, we have to, to fix the time scale. And now 
there's a, there's several different ways with which uh, we could we could fix our time scales. What what I would like to do is I would like to fix uh, the convergence rates to one, so to unit unit convergence rate, for for essentially the best case scenario. And the best case scenario is given by functions uh, which are isotropic quadratic. So so these are functions CLL. Uh, and mathematically, the way we can encode this is. Uh, we can note that uh, if we initialize our equilibrium, uh, our, our uh, algorithm close enough to the to the local minimum, then the solutions will roughly be given as uh, a sum of exponentials, uh, where where we have these coefficients pi j, and we can fix the geometric mean uh, to be to be uh, unity uh, for these functions CLL. And mathematically, this can be done with this expression. So this fixes the partial derivative of uh, G and H. Okay, and so with that, I defined the function class that we consider and uh, the class of algorithms uh, that we consider. And now how do we derive the lower bounds? Well, we, we do two things. First, we'll argue that it is enough to look at the first order approximation. And then in the second step, we'll exploit the fact that our function class is, is invariant under uh, orthogonal transformations. So the first order approximation par parallels very much the ideas uh, earlier in my talk that, so here, what we can say is that if we have nonlinear dynamics and we know that these nonlinear dynamics uh, converge exponentially in, in a neighborhood of, of the, the origin, which is our local minimum, um, then we can conclude that the corresponding linearized dynamics converge with the same rate. Uh, and the contrapositive of the statement implies that the lower bounds on the on the convergence rate of the linear dynamics implies lower bounds on the convergence rate of, of nonlinear dynamics. And intuitively, uh, I, I believe this makes uh, a lot of sense, which is, this is what we would intuitively also uh, assume. And so it's enough to look at the linearization. And if we, if we do the linearization, then uh, we're left with uh, these dynamics here, where we have uh, matrices G, J, uh, and H, J, which correspond, which, which are the partial derivatives evaluated uh, at zero. Um, and, and so the question is, how, what's the, how should we choose these matrices uh, G, J, and H, J, so, so that in the worst case, we achieve, we achieve still a, a fast rate? And in order to simplify these dynamics even further, we will exploit the fact that uh, the function class is invariant under, under orthogonal transformations. And so we were able to derive the following result. So uh, assume that the linearized dynamics converge at a certain rate for all functions in this function class, then it turns out that the same convergence rate can be achieved uh, with dynamics that are invariant uh, under orthogonal transformations. And this, the, the proof of this statement uh, relies on a, on a very famous result from control theory, uh, Karitonov's uh, theorem. Um, and I would like, I, I don't want to go into details, but if you're interested, you can, you can look it up uh, in our article. Uh, but I would like to provide you uh, an intuition for, for this result. And so the way we can, we can interpret this result is we can view it as a two player game. And so one player, chooses the function g and h, so, so these, the dynamical system, and the second player chooses the function f. And the first player tries to uh, maximize the conversions rate, so he wants to converge or uh, converge as quickly as possible, whereas the player two tries to minimize the conversions rate, so he plays against player one. And player two plays second. And now the result says that if g and h are linear, then player one doesn't lose anything if he chooses uh, the dynamics to be invariant under orthogonal transformations. And intuitively, this makes sense because if, if the dynamics are invariant under orthogonal transformations, then player two cannot uh, 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 make the convergence rate worse by rotating the function. And, and I think this provides a, an interesting uh, interpretation of, of, of this result. So with that, 
we're left essentially with a scalar uh, differential equation. And then how do we, how do we uh, a scalar linear differential equation and how do we uh, study the convergence rate of, the, of such a uh, scalar linear differential equation? Well, we, we study the zeros of the characteristic polynomial, uh, which, is, which is given here. Um, and we can then distinguish several different cases. So depending on, on K, remember K was the order of our system. So it's the, the amount of derivatives that we include. Um, and so for K equals one, uh, we obtained gradient flow. And indeed, uh, you can show that the, that, uh, the, the lower bound on the, on the complexity is given by uh, kappa log one over epsilon. Where, where epsilon is the, the tolerance, the, the solution accuracy that you would like to achieve. For, for k equals two, you have accelerated uh, gradient descent. And so the lower bound scales with square root of kappa. And now the interesting thing is to look at the case where k can be larger than two. And, and here it depends. And so if you assume that the zeros uh, of the characteristic polynomial that, you show, that I showed you on the previous slide can be, can be unbounded for large kappa. So if these zeros are allowed to become uh, arbitrarily fast, then the, the lower bound is given by kappa one over k. But if we have these dynamics that, that uh, converge in, in certain, for certain initial conditions, these dynamics converge very, very fast. And the problem is that we cannot discretize uh, uh, these these dynamics with explicit schemes. And so for, for that, you can, you can read a very nice uh, paper uh, from Professor Yelch and Professor Nevan um, And so if we, if we don't allow the zeros uh, to, to, to become arbitrarily large for large kappa, then even when k is greater than two, we're left with uh, the lower bound of square root of kappa log one over epsilon. And so this essentially, uh, recovers our, our discrete time, uh, the, recovers the discrete time uh, result. And what we can easily do is we can come up uh, with, with an algorithm in continuous time that, that achieves the lower bound. So, so here, here's the algorithm. And interestingly enough, we can, we can show that it achieves this lower bound even on, on certain non-convex functions. So in continuous time, we, we don't necessarily need uh, complexity. So this brings me uh, to the end of my talk. I would like to uh, come back to the quote from Arkady Nemirovsky, which I uh, mentioned earlier. He asked for a geometrical explanation. Well, what I think I could uh, provide you was essentially uh, a point of view from, from dynamical systems, a point of view uh, that is rooted in, in physics. And so in, in in my opinion, what causes acceleration? Well, if I would like to summarize the, the picture, uh, the, the results with two pictures, uh, it, it would be the following. So what we need is we need second order dynamics because the important thing is that second order dynamics have inertia. And the fact that these have inertia ensures that even if we change the spring a little bit, the convergence rate will be robust. So, so it will not change as much. And then if we want to translate from continuous time to discrete time, we need to be very much, we need to be very careful and we need to be careful in the case where the damping vanishes. And because in that case, we're left with a Hamiltonian system and there the discretization really matters. But if we use a symplectic integration for the corner case where the damping vanishes, then uh, we can guarantee that everything works well. Um, and and uh, yeah, and, and we can, we can guarantee that this algorithm uh, should, should perform well. And so here I included the picture that should symbolize uh, essentially that uh, Hamiltonian systems have the property that the signed phase space area is conserved along the flow. So, so each of these cats uh, represents uh, some initial conditions and, and now the signed area that's enclosed by these cats is preserved uh, along the flow. And the symplectic integration essentially preserves this property uh, and yeah. Okay, and so with that, I would like to, to thank, uh, yeah, I would like to thank uh, my, my two mentors. So I was very lucky and fortunate to have Raft Andrea and, and Mike Jordan as, as my, my mentors and uh, they uh, shaped my scientific thinking in, in very uh, fundamental ways. 
I would like to acknowledge uh, the uh, financial support that I received from, from Branko Weiss and the Minutes program, as well as all my colleagues at, at UC Berkeley, ETH Zurich, and uh, re more recently, the Max Planck Institute uh, for Intelligent Systems. So as you might uh, know, I uh, recently got appointed uh, independent group leader here at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems. Um, and I have several different uh, PhDs available, uh, which could cover uh, more fundamental work in machine learning, but uh, also more, more applied uh, work. And with that, I'm at the end of my talk, and I would like to thank you very much for your attention. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? <laughs> I guess people are exhausted. Everyone is exhausted, yeah. <laughs> Overwhelmed. Yeah. Yeah, all right. So maybe if there are no questions, we can just stop here. Yeah, so you feel free to contact both speakers and then, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. All right then, okay, I'm just going to thank both speakers. Thank you again, Heidi and uh, Michael for, uh, for both talks. Thank you very much, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Take care, everyone. Oh, okay. Bye, yeah. thanks, bye-bye.